Uh, today we have uh, Andrew Elias as a speaker. He's a student at, uh, in Madri's lab. MIT is visiting us with a bunch of his students this week, and he's going to be talking about how batch norm helps with optimization. Great. Uh, thank you, Jerry. Yeah, so as Jerry said, I'll be presenting about a paper, How Does Batch Normalization Help uh, Optimization? And this is joint work with uh, Shabani and Dimitris, as well as our advisor, Alexander Madri at MIT. Okay, so I'm going to start by talking about the deep learning revolution. Uh, I don't mean by this how deep learning is going to revolutionize all our lives, even though I guess we can have that debate at some point. Uh, what I want to talk about more is the revolution within deep learning. So I mean, less than 10 years ago, we were super happy like building our little digit classifiers with two-layer neural networks. And like this was like state of the art, and everyone was super happy. And then, I guess, nine or 10 years later, we now have like crazy stuff like agents that play Go or recognize ImageNet or like all of these super impressive applications. And so due to the like due to advances in hardware data and algorithms, deep learning has come like a massive way in a really, really short amount of time. <clears throat> and at the core has at the core of these advances have been kind of like this pipeline that I have on this slide, where basically we have some like training data that we want to do something with. We feed it into this massive deep deep neural network, we train it and then it does what we want. Uh, and nowadays, doing this is super, super easy. I could spin up like the, this exact pipeline in like maybe 10 lines of code or something. So I don't know, you like import your favorite deep learning package, you load up a data set, and you train a neural network. Pretty easy. That's it. Uh, so yeah, this convenience might lead us to think that like deep learning is now super easy. Uh, but what I want to do in this talk is kind of make a distinction between something being super simple or super convenient and being easy. Uh, so training deep neural networks is simple, but I don't think it's quite easy yet in the sense that there are like three architectures I can choose between. There's like a fixed learning rate that everyone uses and a fixed optimizer and a fixed set of like tricks. And these tricks have been basically chosen via like natural selection almost. Like someone comes up with some trick, they introduce it. If it works, it stays. If it doesn't work, people eventually forget about it and no one uses it again. Uh, and while this is like good for, I guess, like maximizing the performance of our models, as a result, we don't really understand how a lot of the core components in our deep learning frameworks work. So the goal of this talk, and I guess a general goal within deep learning, is to basically get a better understanding of a lot of the components within uh, the deep learning toolkit, so to speak. So this talk specifically, I'm going to focus on batch normalization. And this is just one component of this deep learning toolkit. And there are many, many more that are all not super well understood. Um, but yeah, today we'll just focus on batch norm. Yeah, so batch normalization, I'll refer to this as like batch norm or BN or something like that. Uh, it was introduced in 2015, and it's a super simple architectural change that you can make to a neural network. Uh, so just to illustrate this, this is how I'll represent a neural network for this talk. You have like some input X and a bunch of layers, and then there's like one layer we're going to focus on. Oh, I guess I have a pointer. There's one layer we're going to focus on, k, and then kind of a bunch of other layers, and then uh, eventually a loss function. So batch norm can basically be thought of as like within one layer, just kind of a drop-in replacement. Uh, sorry, like a drop-in addition to the neural network architecture uh, right after, like, I guess, the weight of this layer. Uh, and what batch norm can be thought of is basically a whitening transformation. So I have data coming into this layer, or I have data coming out of the layer, wk. And I just want to subtract its mean and divide by its standard deviation and basically make the data look like Gaussian, so to speak. And so while I can't exactly do what I have written in red here, um, people essentially use like mini batch statistics. So I feed in a batch of examples x. And then I, yeah, I subtract the empirical mean over the batch, divide by the empirical standard deviation. Uh, and the goal is to make these things close to standard normal. Uh, and in fact, something, I guess, additional is we usually actually learn a new mean and covariance. So I guess in short, the way to think about batch room is just something that helps you control very precisely the first and second moments of the distribution of a batch. Uh, and the goal of this is to, uh, well, we'll talk about the goal of it later, I guess. OK, so first, before I talk about why uh, or like how batch room works, why, do, why would people use batch norm? Like, why has this become so popular? Uh, 
So in this talk, we'll focus on the effect of batch ROM on optimization. Uh, and what that means is like I'm only going, like all the graphs you're going to see in this presentation are at training time. Um, we're not going to, like people claim that batch ROM also has generalization effect, but I'm not going to look into those at all. Um, and, yeah, in general, we didn't. So yeah, here we have a plot, two plots of training a kind of standard VGG network without batch ROM. So here's like the best learning rate we could find, and here's like a slightly higher learning rate. Uh, and so why people use batch room is that when I add batch room to this VGG network, I get training curves that look like this. And so even at like the best learning rate for the non-batch normalized network, I train faster. And for higher learning rates, uh, I seem to be kind of more robust to setting my learning rate. So I can set it even a little higher, and the performance doesn't seem uh, very poorly affected. Yeah, and so as a result, batch ROM has become one of the most influential methods in deep neural network training, and it's basically found by default in like almost all deep learning architectures that you'll use in like a standard library or something. Well, not people, they use Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I guess, yeah, in this paper we focus on batch ROM specifically, but I think that a lot of the techniques can also be applied to these other normalization techniques, um, and that's definitely some way forward. And we also don't have a very good grasp on like the difference between them. That's another future direction that I guess I'll address at the end. Uh, OK, so now that we've kind of covered why we might want to use batch norm, uh, we really get to like the crux of what we want to do, which is understand uh, how it's giving us these benefits at optimization time. So uh, there's been like a huge flood of work on batch norm in like the last one or two years. Uh, and so when I say the story so far, uh, I really mean like what's the classical picture of why batch ROM works. So like how is it introduced? And so batch ROM, as I said, was introduced in 2015. And it was basically introduced to solve the following problem. So I brought up again my picture of how deep neural network trains. Uh, and I'm basically going to view the training of this deep neural network as solving a different optimization problem at every single layer. And what I mean by this is that uh, focusing on one layer, I can just think of all the layers before it, I guess, these guys over here, I can think of all of that as kind of the new input to my optimization problem. And then I can think of all the layers after it as kind of wrapped into my loss function. And so I'm really thinking of this as just a one layer optimization problem. And so the idea behind batch room then is to say, OK, well, if this is a one layer optimization problem, then I have a problem that the inputs to this optimization problem are actually changing as I update the previous weights. So I guess this input pipeline here is determined by a bunch of weights. And all of these weights are being updated simultaneously. And so the inputs to my problem at WK heavily depend on uh, the changes in all the Ws before it. And so a natural thing to do, oh yeah, and I guess so yeah, this kind of idea that the distribution at layer K is shifting is referred to as internal covariate shift, or ICS. OK, so a natural thing to do if I want to prevent this from happening is to just make all of the distribution, is to just fix all of the distributions, right? So I had some problem that like my distributions were shifting around. So what I want to do is just clamp them and not let them shift around. And the idea is that this will help my neural network uh, train faster because my layers don't have to, are like solving the same optimization problem all the time. They don't have to keep shifting. Yeah. <clears throat> and so reducing this internal covariate shift was like the key principle driving the development of batch norm. OK, so we thought, uh, yeah, so in our work, uh, the first question we kind of asked is like, OK, can we just, uh, like as a sanity check, can we just go and observe this internal covariate shift in practice? Uh, so I'll be showing this kind of graph uh, a couple times during this presentation, so I'll explain it now. This is an activation histogram. So we take some layer of the neural network, in this case like layer 11 or layer 3. Uh, we look at the values of the activations, and we just plot them in a histogram over the course of training. So like each kind of slice that you see here is like one iteration in the training. And at each one of those slices is a different histogram showing like the, the frequency of all activation values. Uh, so we first looked at a network with batch room. And like as expected, this network looks pretty nice. Like all the activations look relatively stable. Clearly like the mean and the variance are constant throughout because like that's hard coded in. Uh, and so yeah, nothing unexpected here. 
But when we were comparing this to a network without batch norm, there's no like absolutely striking difference that we saw here uh, in the sense that like it doesn't look like the means are super uncontrolled or there's like a huge shift in mean invariance. And so this kind of like, well, this wasn't something super rigorous. This kind of is what first caught our eye and said, okay, maybe it's worth looking into this internal covariate shift thing a little bit more. Uh, and so yeah, again, this is the same kind of activation histogram where training starts back here and evolves uh, and ends kind of at the front here. And as you can see, the histograms look, I guess, uh, more stable than one would expect given the internal covariate shift hypothesis. So what architecture was this? This is a VGG network. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes you see it looks like this where it's the same, but there are times when it's, it's different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this is like, uh, this, is not the, this is not where we say that like, aha, we've solved it. This is just where we say like, maybe we should look into this more. Um, What's the learning rate used here? Uh, this was the like point one, I want to say, which for is both of them. For mm -hmm. both of them, yeah. So you come, the bottom one converges with point one, right? Yeah. Uh, what's the mean between this and the later one? Sorry. Uh, Sorry. Two seconds. What's the mean about the actual component? What's the mean? What's the mean? mean. mean. Mean of the distribution. Oh, oh, the mean of the distribution. Uh, oh, yeah. So here, this is like zero one batch term. So like we don't we fix it. Yeah. If and then this is also output. like zero is like somewhere here. If VGG is actually output the ReLU, right? Mm -hmm. ReLU is uh, So we, we actually put the batch term between the linear layer and the ReLU, and then we just plot it at the batch term. So basically, the, the mean is still equal to zero. Yeah. So this is without like the learnable parameters? Yeah, so here we use batch room without the learnable parameters. Um, and it still trains fine because you have like a bias on it. You said that the mean for the second thing is inside the bulk of the distributions? Yeah. Is it like close to the mean of the distributions? Or like zero close to the mean of the distributions? Yeah, reasonably close. What does that mean? Uh, like, I don't know, like here. Oh. Oh. Wait, so this is after fee or before fee? This is before fee. Okay. Yeah. So Which is like, why like yeah. it's not like a half normal. Yeah. 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 I, I, yeah. Any other more questions about this would be super welcome because there's going to be a couple more of these plots. So. So for like these like you know without batch normal like what percentage of the things are like on the side of the activation without batch normal? Without batch normal? Oh, I don't think we actually measured that, but the, all the raw data is like available. I think so. Uh, yeah. Okay. So this is kind of just like our introduction to the problem. And so we really didn't see that much difference in stability, but there was still like this large difference in performance. Um, and so obviously we want to like, now that we have something that caught our eye, we want to like make this rigorous and like see if we can actually distill something out of this. Uh, and so what we did here is we said, okay, uh, if we want to like distill out the impact of internal covariate shift, rather than like trying to remove it or like seeing uh, like rather than like seeing whether batch room is actually removing it, what if we just like increase it by the very definition of internal covariate shift? So we have some network with batch room, and then we pick some non-stationary uh, source of noise. So like this is like noise that's not mean zero, like the like yeah, like the noise has random mean. It's not that the noise is mean zero. Yeah, uh, and so we just introduce this noise after the batch room layer of a network. And so the idea here is like, if our claim is that batch room is helping optimization by directly controlling the mean invariance, we'll just completely remove control over these, uh, over the moments of the activation distributions and kind of see what happens. How not zero mean is there? We have the numbers in the paper, but I don't know them off the top of my head. But they're like, <laughs> sorry? It's pretty big. Yeah, you, you'll, you'll, you'll also see a slide uh, that shows it. Sorry, where do you have this slide? Uh, after the batch room. Oh, oh. Yeah, so uh, here are the two activation plots from before, and here's what it looks like for uh, noisy batch room. So, like, uh, I don't know, like, how visible it is, but, like, they're much more unstable, and we can actually quantify how much more unstable they are. So this is, like, the kind of, like, change in mean between time steps and the change in variance. Um, and, yeah, as you can see, like, so the two lines at the bottom here are for the normal network, and the batch room network, and then the noisy batch room network is just like way above all of these. Uh, and so like it's kind of more noise than is, in, like, than is solved by batch room is introduced here. 
OK, and so these are the three training plots that you get for like a standard network, a batch room network, and a noisy batch room network. And what ends up happening is kind of contrary to what we thought. The noisy batch room network actually is much closer to the batch room network than it is to the standard one. Um, so even though we kind of removed all effective con like direct control over the, second, the first and second moments, uh, it seems like we didn't really hinder optimization all that much. Yeah, and so this like definition of dis distributional instability as we defined it had kind of no direct impact on optimization that we could notice. And so given this, uh, we said, okay, what if we kind of throw away this distributional view of internal covariate shift and try to take a more optimization-based view? Kind of Batchroom was introduced to help optimization, so maybe we can just like throw away all of our uh, distributional ideas about it and just think about how it affects the actual optimization problem at each layer. So, uh, uh, yeah. So, for the, the picture that you got with the, the noisy batch room, mm -hmm. how much, this is like, how robust is this to like different choices of like the mean the, that you introduce and the variance that you introduce? It's pretty robust. Pretty robust. Yeah. Okay. Like, we tried really hard, but we couldn't get it to like the standard one as well. It's yeah. really large. Unless you cause exploding gradients or something. Fast forwarding. Okay, yeah. So we know that we train our models at least typically with like first order methods, like gradient descent or like your favorite like adaptive gradient method or whatever. Uh, and so, given that, uh, a reasonable thing to look at if we want to see how much internal covariate shift affects optimization is to actually look at how much the optimization problem is changing due to internal covariate shift. Uh, and so what this means concretely is uh, let's like freeze at some point in training and look at, yes, yeah, so this is the picture from before where we're looking at our uh, neural network training problem as just like an optimization problem at a single layer, uh, K. And so now at this kind of frozen point in training, we have some gradient that we're about to take to kind of update WK with. And now let's say we want to ask basically how much do updates to previous layers change my optimization problem at k, uh, at least locally. And so what we're going to do is we're basically going to take a step with every single weight ex uh, before k. So we're going to basically take a step, as, yeah, changes color. Uh, you're going to take a step with all of the weight matrices from 1 to k minus 1, and we're going to see how much the gradient changes. So this is basically just asking how much, like, uh, yeah, so how much do I, are the optimization problems different between updating with the old values of the weights and updating with the new values of the weights. And this is for like one fixed input x. So this is only changes due to the, the actual change in weight. Wait, sorry, so does bash one figure in here right now? So, so is this with bash one or without bash one? We're going to measure both. Okay. Yeah. And so, so you pass a input through uh, and then you get the gradients and then you measure how the gradient changes between with no batch form or with batch form? So, okay, so yeah, yeah, I can, okay, let's start from the top here. Okay, so you have some input pipeline. This input pipeline could have batch form or not have batch form. Yeah. And this layer, yeah, so, and what we're interested in asking is, basically, I'm going to take a gradient step before I update my layers. So, like, like I guess there's two different experiments, one with batch form and one without batch form. Mm -hmm. In each of these experiments, I do the same thing. I basically look at the gradient of my loss with respect to WK, and then I update all of the previous layers, and I look at how much that gradient changed. And the idea is that like, this is exactly how much the change in weights changed my optimization problem. Mm -hmm. How can you say that a single step will give you enough of a covariant shift to like, substantiate this result? Sorry, do you think you could? Like you said, you only take like one gradient mm -hmm. step for the previous weights, yeah. right? Is one enough? Uh, so one is enough for what we are. Uh, like what we are studying with respect to Batchroom. So like, there's this idea that potentially like Batchroom could be about like more long-term effects and all of that kind of stuff. But I don't think we uh, looked into that or are claiming to look into that. What we're interested in is like uh, the hypothesis that internal covariate shift is kind of this very direct control phenomenon. Uh, but I think looking into like the long-term effect is actually a really interesting direction. So this is just asking like instantaneously like how much am I, uh, how much am I diverging here? Yeah, and so the idea is that if we, if, like, if we believe in this kind of idea that internal covariate shift is changing the optimization problem dramatically, 
we want that change in the optimization problem to basically manifest as a change in the, in the gradient. And so our question is, does Batcherum actually increase this notion of stability? So are we going to find, uh, if we like, believe that Batcherum is kind of making this optimization problem much more stable, what we'd really like to find is that uh, this kind of gradient step stays pretty close to this gradient step for Batcherum and is like wildly different for normal networks. So this is with fixed input? Yes, this is with fixed input. So, so fixed input, you pass through, get the gradients back, mm -hmm. and then you update the weights and you pass the same input through again yeah. and measure the change in WK. Exactly. Well, and so this is just, uh, we've already seen this plot before. This is just showing that, yeah, the bachelor network is actually better. Um, and so, yeah, what we find is that there is basic, essentially no difference between uh, the bachelor analyzed network and the standard one uh, in the sense that, like, this is kind of over all of training. This is at each step we look at, like, we repeat this experiment basically freezing at every single point in training. Uh, and there doesn't seem to be any sort of a uh, big difference between the batch room network and the non batch room network uh, in terms of this definition of internal covariate shift either. So for, for this result, does, uh, does the previous layers have batch room or not? That's what we're talking about. Like, so the red one does not and the blue yeah. one has So, so one the red one does have, like, because we're measuring this at like WK itself. No, no, I'm saying like the, the input layer, there's the previous like, layer, previous, previous layers. Do they yeah, have that, that's or? that's what this corresponds to. Like oh, this I is see. where everything has batch room. This is where the, nothing has batch room. I see. I see. And you've just oh, you fixed layer ten. Yeah. Yeah. So this is like some layer ten. We have like these plots for every single layer, and you can find them in the paper. And we also have like other networks and stuff. Yeah. And so even with this kind of like. Uh, different notion of internal covariate shift that we hoped would capture like more optimization aspect instead of distributional aspect, we still couldn't really find some like marked difference between uh, a batch normalized network and a non batch normalized network. Uh, and actually, in our paper, we also studied uh, some different networks where batch rom actually kind of increased this. Uh, and we didn't look into this too much, but uh, it was kind of sufficient to say that batch rom doesn't decrease this. Okay, so. Uh, at least so far, uh, our experiments kind of led us to believe that maybe this, like, there isn't as strong of a connection between like, this direct control over mean and variance and what we think of as internal covariate shift. Uh, and so our question became, OK, can we actually uh, give some plausible explanation for why Batcherum helps uh, optimization? So okay. yeah, so why is Batcherum effective uh, at training time? OK, so again. We're going to basically step back and take it from first principles. We know that, uh, I've already said this before, I guess, but we know that we use first order methods in practice to train these neural networks. And so again, we want to look at like, basically first order phenomena. And so we proposed uh, like a pretty simple experiment where we basically freeze training again at some time t. And then we have some, so this is for a single layer. We have some value of the weight, uh, wt. Uh, the gradient kind of gives us a direction which we think will improve our loss, or like a negative direction which we think will improve our loss. And like if we were just training this neural network, we would just like set that to wt plus one and keep going. Uh, what we're going to do instead is basically look at this entire gradient direction uh, and basically take steps of varying size along this direction. Uh, and as we take these steps, we're basically going to look at the variation in loss and the variation in gradient along these steps. Um, and so what this is telling us is essentially how predictable our function is along the gradient direction. So if you have like a, I guess, yeah, thinking about like from an optimization point of view, if you have something where like the loss is like very predictable along the gradient direction, you can afford to take bigger steps. If something is like super unpredictable along the gradient direction, then you have to take like really, really small steps to ensure that like you're still in like the decreasing part of the function. So, so could you repeat what this plot is again? Yeah. So, so basically, we have uh, yeah. we have a gradient direction just given by yeah. like the gradient step, and we take steps of varying size. And at each one of these like at each one of these frames, we have a different value of step, and then we measure. You're taking it in the same gradient. Step. In the same gradient direction, okay. we like so like for this value of w prime, yeah. we look at what the loss is yeah. and what the gradient is, okay. and then we repeat that for a bunch of different step sizes. And then we look at the total variation in the loss and the total variation in the gradient. Okay, sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
So the idea is that in the loss, if you have like tons of local variation, then like, like from an optimization perspective, you need to take a really, really small step to ensure that your gradient is actually predictive and that you like actually decrease your function value. And from a gradient perspective, uh, I guess like it just kind of implies, uh, it's like similar to smoothness in the sense that like if you have really, really large fluctuations in gradients along the gradient direction, yeah, it is really analogous to smoothness in the, fact, in the sense that you'll have much, much less reliable gradients. OK, so we measured this along uh, a bunch of different points in training. And what we got are plots like these. And so I'll explain these uh, right now. So yeah, a single vertical cross section of this plot is one run of the experiment that I just described. Uh, so here we have the variation in loss. So like at some point in training, this was the minimum loss, and like that was the maximum loss uh, for the batch room network and the non batch room network. And in the same way, uh, we had this measure of gradient predictiveness, and so like this was the like minimum, and this was the maximum. Um, yeah, and so each like we basically measure this throughout training, and what we find is that uh, batch room seems to have seems to have like a very profound effect on the optimization landscape uh, of neural networks. Uh, in in like in particular, what we find is that here uh, it makes the landscape much smoother. And it makes the landscape much uh, easier to navigate. And so like, I guess if it helps to think about it, the kind of analogs from convex optimizations, you can think of this as kind of like continuity, like, like Lipschitzness. And here you can think of as like, like smoothness, but in the direction of the gradient. Um, obviously, those aren't like direct parallels, because like we know that neural networks don't satisfy these things. So don't satisfy these things. But they kind of correspond to the same uh, convenience in optimization, or utility in optimization. OK, so uh, delving a little deeper, we wanted to say, OK, let's just look at a single layer and see if we can kind of uh, theoretically analyze the phenomenon that's happening here. Uh, so again, we have one layer with a batch run uh, layer right after, one linear layer with a batch run network right after it, and then some arbitrary loss function that comes after it. Uh, and we're going to uh, basically make no assumptions on what the input to that layer is and what the loss function is, other than uh, for some of the results, we want it to be convex. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, we kind of proved a bunch of things that correspond to each of the experiments, but uh, the kind of, yeah, the kind of uh, the crux of what's happening is that we can prove, we can show provably all of the effects that we noted in the graphs. So this is uh, for Lipschitzness. So here we have, uh, okay, let me parse this here. So this is the effect of Batram on the Lipschitzness of the loss function. So here is the gradient. Uh, of the loss function with respect to some activation in a batch room network. Uh, and what we can show is that this is bounded uh, in terms of the norm of the gradient in the standard network with both a multiplicative decrease that corresponds to like my control over the activations divided by uh, their variance and an additive decrease. Um, so kind of if you take one thing away from this, what we can show is that provably the batch room network, uh, the batch room layer in this case, is going to be more Lipschitz um, under some like very mild conditions than the standard network. And we can prove really similar things for uh, the other plot I showed you, which is like the smoothness in the direction of the gradient. Why is the multiplicative thing a decrease? Yeah, so the multiplicative thing is a decrease when you have, so yeah, what, what it should be is like, this is like a multiplicative stability term almost, which makes you like invariant to. Uh, changes in like the batch variance and then an additive like decrease. Yeah, this is like a strict decrease, and then this is just like if you're like this makes you constant with respect to your uh, with your batch variance. Cool. So yeah, we also show in the paper that like the gradients become more predictive, and we can show that uh, this translates into. Uh, like concrete worst case improvements on like some very popular like distributions. Like if the input is Gaussian, <laughs> if the loss is L2, or like all of these conditions. So at some point I thought you were not changing like the, the gamma and the mu and stuff? Yeah, so for the experiments, uh, for the most part, we don't train gamma and mu. Okay. Here, but in the theory, we analyzed it with gamma and mu. Because it seems like it's important here, right? The gamma. Yes. Well, vaguely, I guess, because like, the gamma can, like, this term can almost be thought of, like, rescaling. 
Yeah. Because like at the end of the day, like, like you're still going to move that amount, I guess. Yeah, but like if you're scaling up, then this could cause it to be less stable. Basically. If you haven't properly learned gamma. Yeah, if you if you haven't properly learned gamma. Yeah, I, I guess. Or if, or if you don't learn gamma. And yeah, yeah. So I guess. Yeah. There is definitely room for more studying of the gamma and beta, but I guess like we thought the core phenomenon to study here was like the normalization itself. So for the most part, for the experiments, we did it without beta and gamma. But and this like is, this is this is I mean this works for any gamma, right? You could just say gamma to be one. And then well, gamma is learned, so that, that's the like. But if when you were not learning it, you could still say gamma to be yeah, one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then this is like the setting of your experiment. Mm -hmm. but then this says that you could. I mean, I guess it makes sense that you could like scale up. Yeah. In this case. Yeah. Which would be not improving the elliptic right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, in practice, like. This sigma is like four or something for a neural network, so it is actually scaling down. Uh, and so, like to actually scale this up, you'd have to have like really, really small variance, smaller than what you'd find in like training networks. Are there any questions about this part? I guess. Okay. Uh, so, one interesting thing that we found in our theory is that uh, at the end of kind of. Uh, looking at it, we found that there wasn't anything special about like them being the first and second moments of the distribution, and the normalization was kind of more important than the fact that we were subtracting the mean and dividing by the variance. Uh, in particular, one thing we could predict is like, what if we normalize by some other uh, kind of notion of stability than just like first and second moments? Okay, so here is what Batram looks like. Uh, <laughs> okay, so yeah, just as a refresher, here's what Batram looks like. I take my data, I subtract the empirical mean, I divide it by the empirical standard deviation, and I add some learnable parameters. Uh, so what if we kind of threw away this idea of like first and second moments and instead just took any LP norm? Uh, so this is just a reminder of what an LP norm is, but in general what we're going to do is we're going to take y, we're going to subtract this mean, and then we're just going to divide by any kind of idea of the scale of y. Uh, and we chose any LP norm to be the, an idea of the scale of y. So in, con in general, this gives you no direct control over the moments of the distribution. Uh, and yeah, in general, you can see that the ones that we normalize without L2 norm are kind of more unstable. Uh, but it does give you kind of comparable properties. Um, yeah, comparable properties in, in, in the sense of the landscape. So if you think back to the landscape plots that we showed for Batcharm, we see really, really similar phenomena happening here. Uh, and so uh, what we find is that even with these kind of alternative normalization schemes that don't have direct control over the moments, but still have the nice uh, landscape properties, we still get the same kind of, oh, is that? Hey, can you go to the next plot? I uh, just, you know, no, no, to, to yeah, this. This one? Yeah. I'm just a little bit confused. Wouldn't you get the same kind of plot if you just divide loss by a constant? Or you input by a constant? Yes. I mean, yes. you would see that from this point of view, it, it will match the base normal, right? From this point of view, <coughs> yes, but you are training with the same weights, I guess. Is the same what? Sorry, like. I, I'm just um, trying to understand why mm -hmm. these plots actually show us that it's better. Because yeah. if you just divide loss by a constant, it doesn't change anything. It's just the scale of the link, right? That's yes, changed. yeah. So, it, like, I guess <coughs> that's what you see, like, here, I guess, right? Where, like, I could just divide, like, I could just make my sigma arbitrarily big or small. And, like, that would change my Lipschitzness. No, not only sigma, just the L itself, if I, like, divide. Yeah, but it's, it is the same loss function for <coughs> batch room and non batch room, right? Well, the loss is the same, but uh, uh, going from the input or from the weight to loss is not the same. Like the function, the total function is not the same. The scale might be different just because you're normalizing. Mm -hmm. uh, but this also manifests at the last layer, where like my loss is actually the same. Right, but you can have the same function. Yeah. The scale of your inputs by the time you get to that function is different. Mm -hmm. and that could, I mean, so but that's captured here, right? Right, but maybe you can get the same just if you divide by a constant. But, so you have a mapping from input to loss, right? And this is the same both for normal and batch normal. Right? I guess the question is if I replace batch normal with just the operation that takes my input and divides by 10, yeah. presumably yep. the latter, this should not work. Yes, but that's actually captured here, right? Like you couldn't get an additive decrease that way. You would get a huge one for the decrease. Yeah. 
Yeah, but then it will take you longer to actually convert it. Oh, you have better lipshades constantly. Well, yeah, the, the conversions should not be changed because you didn't you you change anything. anything. But uh, just from this point of view of uh, better lipshades, you can get arbitrary. This is the same as having a smaller learning rate, right? Mm -hmm. This is the same as having a smaller learning rate? You will need right. to have bigger link rate with divide the loss by a factor, I think, yeah, or the input. So it's, it's kind of the same. Uh, it, it seems if you just do this, and if you forget what we do, and you look only at the plots you have, and uh, uh, we can measure any kind of efficiencies, you'll see uh, pretty much the same effects as for batch norm, uh, like batch norm and dividing loss by constant or dividing yeah. input by constant will look exactly the same. Right? Yes, or for smaller yes. learning, you will mm -hmm. get exactly the same effects. Right, so doesn't it uh, mean that this is not the only thing batch norm is doing? It's not just the change in the Lipschitz, it's something more kind of fundamental. But it's changing the Lipschitz for the same loss yeah. and for the same learning rate, right? And this is the interesting thing. Yeah. Like you're right, for all these experiments, so the you could cheat these experiments by doing something weird. Yeah. The idea is like Batron doesn't do that. We know that it doesn't do that. I guess, does that, and I, I'm happy to talk about it more actually, but like, I guess back to these plots, like, like the idea is that you know that the, like you control all of that stuff. Like I could just take all my inputs X and divide them by something, but like I didn't, and this still happens. You did something much more complicated. Uh, Wait, so what is it? What is? It? I, I guess I'm just. Mm -hmm. I guess the question is like, is what? There must be some experiment that you did. Yeah. That would have a difference between batch norm and just dividing everything by ten of, of, of these sorts. Right? Like, so you can't divide everything by ten, but then you don't converge as fast, right? Yeah. If you just take a standard network but, and add the layer that divides. So like the fact everywhere. that this the question is like of these, you know, kind of scientific experiments, mm -hmm. which ones would change, or would they would they look the same? Would these pictures look the same? If you just, the, I guess, like, like, it's like trivially, like this one, right? right. Like these no, guys. No, no, but I, just, I mean, so we agree. I mean, I think everybody agrees that if you just divide by ten, then you're not going to get good mm -hmm. results. Um, divide the input. Yeah, divide the input at every instead of replace batch number by an operation that divides by ten. I think yeah. everybody agrees that that's not going to work. Mm -hmm. um, but there's an explanation for like why batch number does something, and this is for you to do these like scientific experiments. That you evaluate all these like delicious things or whatever, but the same scientific experiments, as far as I understand right now, would suggest that dividing by ten would have this picture. Yeah, so so it would in, one interesting thing is in the batch norm paper, if you don't backdrop through the mean and the variance that you divide by, you don't get the same gains. Like if you just like just do the scaling, like if you know the traditional idea of whitening is just by divide by yeah. the mean and like sure. do this normalization. But if you don't backdrop through this, you don't get any benefits of batch norm. You have to do the backdrop and get that additive term to actually improve these. Like if I just blindly divide it by the variance without backdropping to it, I should still get these benefits by the scaling argument, right? If I took the same variance, but I just didn't do the backdrop to it. But that doesn't work as well in practice as flash. It doesn't work at all. And this is like this is in the original flash paper. I feel like that's what I'm yeah, But I think the question is how is that going to show up in the plots? Like those two. No, mm -hmm. yeah, not like these plots, but the other experiments. Like, so I guess, like, maybe to stress, like, like, the important thing is not this plot or this plot, it's the fact that they co occur, right? Like, the fact that while Bachelor improves faster, it's also more Lipschitz is the interesting thing. Because I can make any function Lipschitz by just dividing by something. Uh, but I, I, like, if it was just a scaling down, then I could not co observe this plot. And this plot. I thought I thought the uh, I thought this plot was supposed to be explaining the next plot. Yeah. I thought the fact that you know things are smoother and stuff mm -hmm. is supposed to explain the fact that we converge better. Yes. But that can't be. It. But then then dividing by ten would predict conversion better, right? But that's not true. No. So the, I guess. Like, yeah, so this is not like a causal proof. It's yeah. like if you look at these plots, then you definitely... Yeah, it's not, it's not like supposed to be like, if I see this, then I should think it converges better. Okay. The interesting thing is like, why does Batchroom work so much better? Well, we know it's not like, like dividing by something, and yet it still does this. So the claim is that if you get these plots without doing weird things, then you should converge faster. Yeah. So I could imagine the plus L infinity group to be similar to adding to, to dividing a constant. 
mm -hmm. every layer by constant, yeah. which means that actually if you divide by a constant every layer, then you would get a But you also have to back prop through that constant. Like, you, like just dividing by a constant doesn't actually work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dividing by a constant is different from that dividing through a constant that you're dividing by. But I get what you're saying. You're saying that if it was just if you just looked at yeah. this plot and you divide it by ten, maybe it would look similar. Mm -hmm. And that like is not just does not directly imply that you would converge faster. It's just that you converge faster, like I'm saying, without doing anything absurd. And this is like an explanation for what Yeah, okay. I'm also just confused by some like experiment setup and everything mm -hmm. now. Previously, at some point, we were not back cropping through the mean things, and now we are. No, we always back cropping. Always, always back cropping. Back -cropping. Back -cropping. It doesn't work otherwise. Okay. Like it'll just be the same as training in normal. But then, do you have any claim in uh, similar to like patch norm works because of something? Like, yeah, I guess that's like can be that. thought of as here, right? Like. But but I can achieve the same effect by dividing by something. So it's not just this, right? But you can't get this by dividing by something, right? But I mean, the thing I, I can make the thing on the left yeah. side as small. Uh, I mean. I can make this bond as close to zero as I want. So I guess in theory we also prove that the same solution that's optimal for the normal network is remains optimal for the rational network, which would not be the case if you just scale it. Right? So if you divide your own your loss by two, then you also need to optimize to a smaller loss by, right? If you want to say have good training performance. You would need to optimize to epsilon number two instead of epsilon. But right? if you scale your inputs down by C, your your weight optimal weights would change, right? But like we show that the same solution is optimal for the rational based network as well. So I guess that it re removes this fact that it's just pure scaling. Okay. So if you look at it from like a convex optimization, you know that how fast you converge depends on how far away you are from a good solution, plus your smoothness ellipses constant, right? And Bashroom does not change how far you are or how big your loss is or all these things. I see. Okay. Assume that you're operating within the same problem. But you just have better optimization properties. properties. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I guess we are here. Are there any more questions? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So just to recap, I guess what we've done so far. Uh, yeah. Our goal is to kind of understand the exact role of batch room and optimization. Uh, and so our first kind of step was revisiting the classical definition of, uh, or the classical hypothesis for why batch room is so effective. Uh, and that was internal covariate shift, the idea that like direct control over the mean and variance helps you stop some sort of like distributional instability that's hindering optimization. And we found that both in the sense of like distributional instability and like optimization instability, we couldn't really kind of pin down a link between batch room and internal covariate shift. Uh, and so. Uh, rather than looking at distributional properties, we kind of re-looked at the optimization landscape, and what we found is that Batchroom actually has a kind of a really simple smoothing effect uh, on the loss landscape of training these neural networks. Um, and I guess, yeah, as our kind of discussion resulted in, yeah, I should have mentioned that earlier, I'm sorry. Yeah, we showed that like, it's not actually just due to like, rescaling of the loss, uh, <coughs> that like, your optimum are actually in the same place. Uh, oh, oh, okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so like moving forward, there are a ton of future directions uh, to go here. Like we don't claim to have uh, fully explained um, explained like the deep learning toolkit or even fully explained batch room. There's still questions of like, can we kind of exploit uh, what we found here and, and design methods that kind of make optimization nicer directly rather than like methods that were designed to address distributional instability and like happen to make optimization nicer? Um, can we kind of pin down the relationship between batch normalization and generalization. Uh, there's also the question of, I guess Greg is gone now, but what Greg brought up earlier, which is like um, different people have like, or different subfields even seem to prefer like different up, uh, normalization methods. And there's no uh, so far analysis of like how those different normalization methods work or what the relationship between them are. Uh, and more broadly, just understanding kind of all the components of this like deep learning toolbox that makes deep learning so easy. Uh, yeah, and so we have a blog post about all these results that uh, also have more results uh, at our blog, and then our archive paper is over there. And thank you.
I actually have one question, uh, which was, uh, what is a, does your theory say anything about like what batch sizes you should use in batch mode or anything, or do you have any, does that have any effect? So, our theory doesn't really talk about that, no, no. Okay. Um, it must, it must be yeah, it must, well, so there are actually some really, really interesting like empirical studies on that, not by, uh, not by us, but like there's one that shows that like if you actually use too many samples for Vacheron, it like starts to get worse after a while. And there's one that shows that like you actually only need something like ten samples, was it? Or like, is this all for, I think all of this for genetics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like it's still optimized as fine. Yeah, I think this effect of batch size is more about the genetization yeah. performance because people think that Vacheron does something to make it efficient. And so, yeah. But in terms of optimization, I don't think it's super yeah, well studied. Um, and I think, like, in general, yeah, our thing doesn't super care about what the batch size is. Uh, also, is there a dependence on the number of layers? Because I can think that if you have very few layers, batch norm should actually make optimization more difficult because of the noise you introduce. Uh, and you kind of, I mean, but if it's um, uh, like a lot of layers, then I can understand that the benefits of kind of normalizing everything outweigh the noise. But in general, um, did, did you observe that the noise makes it more hard? I don't, we didn't uh, actually try training with like super shallow or super deep networks. Um, so we don't have like a really good picture of that. I think Greg actually has a recent paper that showed that like you can't train with batch room past some certain number of layers, um, which is like, like I don't fully understand. Uh, like I think he'd be the person to talk to you there, but like I don't, have any concrete grasp of like how super shallow or super deep networks interact with batch normalization. Uh, and our theory, I guess I should say, is like proof for like a single layer where you swap it out and you assume everything is the same. So uh, there is some controversy in uh, where to put batch norm, you know, after redo, before redo, and like, there are, there is in fact one paper one. Uh, uh, so do you, f do, did you find anything related to like, uh, how much difference that makes? I think like like we just studied it between like we just put it before the rally. Okay. I think we did maybe like one test and we saw that it got better test accuracy and then we just kept it for the rest of the experiments. But in general, it's like a control. But we didn't. Uh, because we, we it's didn't really like vary. if you look at it, any standard network, that's where it is. Yeah, yeah but I think the first paper, the original paper, used the other way. Yeah. The next paper. Yeah, I, I, I think like there were like there's there's like some weird controversy where like some people say I don't think it actually makes a huge difference for optimization performance. Um, and like for our theory and our empirical results, we just always put it between the linear layer and the rally. Uh,